morning, afternoon and evening, people from Latin America here in Europe and in Central Asia for the people that is connected. Uh, I am very happy to have here the opportunity to moderate this session, actually one more of the SDG and Nexus seminar series. And this time uh, we have the, the opportunity to present uh, one of the five topics, the main research topics of SDG Nexus Network, uh, this is food system. And I'm very happy to have three female early career scientists here with us who will present uh, their projects, their perspectives relating to food systems. Uh, first and all, we will have the presentation of Frida Rodriguez Ramos. She's a PhD candidate in sustainable development at Quintana Roo's Autonomy University in Mexico, project manager at Health, Environmental and Community NGO in Mexico, and nutrition professor at the School of Nursing and Nutrition at the Autonomous University of San Luis Potosí in Mexico. Uh, our second presenter is Diana Blanco. Uh, she's a PhD candidate at Colegio de la Frontera Sur, ECOSUR in Mexico. And uh, we have as comments at all to join the ideas to, to put on the table what collaboration could be or what future lines can be identified. Uh, this will be Maria Gracia Glass. She's a colleague of us in the Justus Divic University and a doctoral candidate in the Center for International Development and Environmental Research. So with this short introduction, will be, uh, the will be 15 minutes for uh, the two present presentations we will have. Later, Maria Gracia will make like 10 minutes comments. And after that, will be like an open discussion to, to having the opportunity to have these great speakers here, then they will answer our doubts and our questions regarding the, the talks. So with this uh, introduction, I will then open the, the floor, the virtual floor in this case for Rina Rodriguez Ramos that will present a uh, woman's land period and difficulties in managing food production. So welcome and please Rina, the floor is yours. I want to thank the organizer for the invitation to be here and thank the opportunity to share some of the experience lived in my hometown. I am uh, Frine Rodriguez, and I want to talk about food systems, especially about women's land tenure and the difficulties in ma managing food production. First, I want to share a picture of my city. Uh, here we can see Mexico, and I hope many people know where it is. And this cute is now so here, here in the center. Oh, here. It's San Luis Potosí, my stage. And in the southwest of San Luis Potosí, we can see San Luis Potosí capital. Here. Uh, which is also called San Luis Potosí. And finally, in this map, I can show you the metropolitan area of San Luis Potosí. This area concentrates the most, um, the higher percentage of population living in San Luis Potosí and is uh, structured by six municipalities. But uh, I will uh, focus my presentation just in two of them, which are uh, San Luis Potosí and Mesquitic de Carmona. This is because uh, Mesquitic de Carmona mainly uh, is focused on food production. And finally, I have here another map. I choose you to show this map because we can see how the land purpose is apparently uh, for agriculture. The blue zones are dedicated for irrigation, irrigation agriculture and the gray zones are for rain-fed agriculture. But in the following map, I can show you how they are distributed the, the urban areas and the rural areas in this metropolitan area of San Luis Potosí. I want to show how they are um, connected and what is the, the treats that they face. 
Uh, first, in Mesquitic de Carmona, we have Ejido Las Moras. Ejido Las Moras, here, is um, one of the main producers of vegetables in the region. Farmers sow and harvest different products like vegetables, aromatic herbs, and even flowers. And all the harvest is taken to sale in the Bicentenario market, which is here, not so far. And uh, all the products are sold here in the Bicentenario market in both ways, wholesale and retail. And after that, uh, all the products are uh, sold in different markets and people can buy them and enjoy fresh vegetables uh, in their own houses. It seems like a good food system in many ways because as consumer you can buy local products and as farmer production uh, and as a farmer the chain production is short uh, but there are a treat that increases the vulnerability of producers. What is this? the growth of urban area. In this map, I can show you how the growth of urban, urban area is increased in recent years, since 90s to 2017. In red, we can see the most recent urbanization and how they are increased their size in precisely this direction. Therefore, we observe as a serious threat that um, the growth of the urban area is particularly in San Luis Potosí increased in, years, in recent years. Um, now, the average of uh, the average of growth of the urban area is uh, four percent since the 2000, and this is higher than population growth. Um, how this affect the uh, food production? Okay, the land used for food production is also land with valuable resources like uh, water, and we live in a desert. Uh, therefore, water is an uh, important asset, not just for food production, so for real estate industry. This trait is added to the fact that the high variability of prices and added to the food loss that is common in this kind of communities and this causing limit profit for farmers and with all of this how is the role of women in the food production here or in this kind of community the women works is focused on three main activities first the worker scale or family care. Mostly of the times are the same. And uh, women bring the food to farmers during the working hours. Secondly, during the harvest season, uh, women constantly work in this activity. And finally, on market sales. Many of women have the task of selling the products of the market. And if, as you can see, none of these activities are directly related with the management of production. All the crucial decisions are, are made by family leader, uh, which commonly is the husband, and women only collaborate in necessary activities. In this particular scenario, in San Luis Potosí, just the 30% of land is owned by women. In rural areas, this percentage is lower. And why is this important? This is crucial because land tenure right, right um, is necessary for women to join in programs uh, about the supporting of the development in agriculture. Therefore, um, if women cannot have their land tenure, they cannot afford the programs that can help with agricultural development. Therefore, 
they are submitted to men's decision. This is why it's so important the um, Sustainable Development Goal 10, I mean in reducing the inequalities. For example, in Mexico, uh, in rural areas, uh, there are a land tenure system called ejidal lands. Um, ejido, it's a land which corresponds to the land where uh, were used in large plantations and then were distributed among the workers uh, after the revolution in 1940. And this system allows the inheritance of land and donation for the benefit for the community, but um, does not allow the land sale. And this practice reduces the opportunity for women to inherit the land because men maintain the land's, ten, the land's pos possession in order to provide the, their families. But for women, um, the land tenure can only access through the marriage. Then, uh, I thought land tenure is not only the problem of this community that this community faces, uh, it is a problem that goes through different in many streets of Mexican rural areas face. For example, uh, the lack of land tenure, of the disparity in land tenure, uh, makes it possible for women to manage their resources. And if add this to the instability of market prices, it becomes really difficult to uh, have a better management of the production and uh, maintain practices with lower environmental impact. If we add those streets, uh, we have a scenario in which the lack of opportunities are yeah. complicated. As I said, the lack of opportunities in the rural areas causes a great migration of men and youth and inducing the abandonment of this arable land. Um, this is really the main threat uh, rural areas face because, as I said, this land is um, an asset that real estate companies are um, want. So, um, leaders in this in these communities, um, many times with uh, political interest, um, tr uh, tr want to gain power through the land sale. Um, the land can be sold in in particularly way, but um, it can be sold um, the rights for the land tenure by the by the leaders in the community. So, um, if the land, uh, if the right to buy the land is opened, um, then uh, it reduces the means of sustenance for many families. And this is why reducing inequalities through the elimination of practices that limit the access of women to resources and managerial activities uh, can generate synergies that have positive impact on well-being uh, for rural population. For example, the land tenure could, could contribute to reducing the economic dependence and um, women can use uh, resilient techniques in food production, like acquisition of infrastructure and technology, and finally maintain their control on their land and reduce the risk caused by the change in their land use due to the growth of cities. Finally, I want to show on this picture how uh, there are many examples of um, that we have documented in Ejido Las Moras. We can observe abandoned lands like here and those here, greenhouse projects that have stopped producing because uh, of bad administration and of the other hand uh, the land and the greenhouses that are producing successfully. 
with this, we can see that uh, successful production is possible, but it's imperative that women uh, can decide their own resources for the future of their families uh, because they are the future for these communities. I want to thank you and I expect the further questions. At the NAP. So please, uh, Diana will present uh, realities, different voices and intersections against from diversity. So Diana, uh, welcome again and the floor is open for you. Oh, good morning from south of Mexico in Chiapas. Um, I want to thank you, all of you, for being here, especially Maria, Alicia, Catalina and Fene for sharing this space. Um, uh, besides, it's very early in the morning here. <laughs> my English is not my native uh, language, so I excuse myself if I make uh, some kind of mistakes. So, yeah, I want to start with uh, give some context. Uh, this uh, investigation It's a part of my uh, dissertation in Desafiando a la Invisibilización Histórica, Relatos de Vida de Mujeres Celtales desde sus Intersecciones, which translate challenging histor historical invisibility, life stories of Celtal women from their intersections here in Chiapas, south of Mexico. So I want to give you some content in the presentation that I'm going to sh share today, context, why why is this important our intersections the ones that intersect between um the people that i've been working with and me and some co conclusion not only in the con in this context but in the context of food systems so context uh well Frine gave a lot of context so i'm going to specify some of the context here in Chiapas, we, uh, well, Mexico has created ethnic diversity, but at the same time has multidimensional poverty, which it's far 40%. People from native population are four times poorer. When I speak, uh, when I see, when I say native populations, I mean indigenous people, but, uh, with my political position, I I give these uh, native populations a, a whole new meaning. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, women from native populations in rural in rural areas live in great inequality. So for Chiapas, uh, is the second state with the largest population of native populations. It, it lives with 85% of margin, marginality, 77 multidimensional poverty, and discrimination based on gender, ethnicity, rural origin, class, and age. So here I ask you what it means to be a Celtan woman in Chiapas. It can, it can be a very um, threatening situation. So the region that I work in is Región de los Altos Otzil y Celtal, which is the majority of native populations. It has the highest index of multidimensional poverty. 17 of the municipalities, 15 are classified as multidimensional poor. And they, uh, like in the literature, says that factories of paid pubs, you know? so. The, the, fa the, the factor of migration here is very, 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 very strong. So a lot of uh, young adults, especially men, uh, have these migration routes, which are incredible, incredibly violent to be able to eat and give food to their families. And in Amatenango del Valle, which is the uh, specific region that I work in, is mostly Celtal, uh, which Celtal and Sotzil are Mayan um, native populations. Uh, it's a rural municipality and it, it has very high degree of mar marginalization and poverty, and it's increasing. 
So in rural areas of Chiapas, the division between men and women is emphatic. So women, it's the one, women are the ones that go to make the food and they uh, are the ones that uh, see the house clean, you know, and the men are the ones that goes, go, goes to the agriculture. So this assignment has made the role and work of women invisible, and most of the time they have a double or triple workload, especially because the men are migrating. Chiapas historically has been characterized by deep inequality, poverty, and violence, phenomena that have hit women harder to the patriarchal scheme and its structures in rural areas. So it's a kind of combi combination of this division between men and women. Disadvantages compared to the gender, class, and ethnicity, and not only of these of these uh, markers of difference. No, so age is also a uh, a very very strong point. Uh, sexuality is also a, a very strong point. This context of inequality intensifies in the experience of women from na native and rural populations where most of their work focuses on social reproduction. Social reproduction meaning they are the ones that have the responsibility to make life, you know, not only, you know, this biological side of making life, you know, being pregnant, but also the, uh, you know, like the everyday life, you know, like who, who are the ones that uh, give food to their families? Who are the ones that take care of their children? Who are the, who are the ones that um, have the main income? In this case, in Amatenango, they are. So this context of inequality um, intensifies considering that women are the ones who take full responsibilities of providing foods to their families. So the contributions to their to the food security and food sovereignty in family systems are invisible as when from their assignment, you know, this very emphatic assignment. This historic invisibility has resulted in certain hierarchies that generate inequalities, oppression and structural violence against the diverse bodies that inhabit this territory. So again, what it means to be a woman from Chiapas who is a, a who is Eltal, for example, um, who lives in rural uh, context. Uh, so this is the point that I'm making, you know, they already live in inequality, you know? So why? The homogenization and addition of women, their identities, identities can give false and shallow hegemonic narratives. It makes invisible the contribution of women in the process of harvesting, transforming, and feeding their families. Historically, rurality in Mexico has been described through a masculine social group. So, it's, it's not only really difficult to understand the diversity of women, but it's very difficult if you just call them indigenous people when it's uh, known that it has a lot of, uh, you know, um, range their identities. So, uh, if you if we as a scientist, especially, <laughs> um, keep giving this, uh, you know, um, discourses about how these people that we are working with are uh, homogenic and they don't have a uh, either voice or uh, diversity, then we are homogenization also, uh, their lives and their inequalities. So our intersections, I'm going to talk about their intersections, uh, these women intersections, the, the ones that I work with, 
with a very respectful manner because they are not here and they should be here with me uh, giving this um, talk. So they are women, uh, they are Celtales, which again is a Mayan group. Uh, they are single, they are married, they are consensual or domestic union. Uh, the ones that are married, they do not have uh, land tenure, tenure, for example because of freenesses, no? So uh, only if you are a widower, you can own land from your husband. Uh, they are from 20 to 50 years old. They are mothers, they are aunts, sisters, friends, cousins, daughter, nieces. So they are a lot of, they represent they a lot of identities, not just they are mothers and they can bear children. They say they no hay mucho dinero, which is there's not much money. So the class there, it's a very um, a specific point. Um, they are caregivers also, not only for their children, uh, for their uh, nephews and nieces. They are artisans po with pottery and hand embroidery, which both are made by them and they provide the highest income. They subsidize the milpa, which is the main subsistence agriculture system, and it's a traditional one, so it has a lot of years with um, Maya um, populations. In the other hand, on the other hand, sorry, <laughs> it's me. No, I am a woman. I am white. I am red as white here in Latin America. I am Colombian, so with these these two intersections make my life easier, you know. So we have to start to talk about not only in academia but in all of our lives, uh, in our life or our spaces of life, that we talk from privilege. This is not talk about. It's like a, almost like a di divorce between the people that we are working with in, in field and the publications that we are making. So we have to talk that, uh, and for example, in my case, I am white and I, I am very, very privileged. I am a student, so I have uh, an income, a, um, a very uh, secure income. I am single, I am from a city context, I am 33 years old and I'm a middle class. So this gives me relation, relational privileges uh, compared with the women that I'm working with. So some conclusions that I want to share with you is that rural areas of Chiapas where more women play a vital role not only in the social reproduction of the family, but also in the economic subsistence of their families and of agriculture systems. Their role remain invisible due to hier hierarchical structures. So age, social, class, ethnicity, gender intertwined to explain women's position and those of other minorities that also require attention in rural areas and regarding to native populations. And the same markers of difference are the ones that put me in a, a relation of privilege in front of them. So recognize the importance of women contributions to food systems and why they are made invisible in this context, especially in Mexico and Chiapas. Again, uh, and it's a calling, it's a call for me and for my experience to academia and to all of these uh, sustain, sustainable goals, you know, it's that uh, in the almost in the homog homogenization process uh, of wanting to make life better without inequalities, for example, we forget that there so there is so much uh, diversity, you know. So we have to take take into account, for example, the, uh, the territory, the, the, the context, you know, the territories uh, to make a better uh, and more um, consensual uh, agreement.
or interventions because uh, it's not only the fact that we um, I don't know um, have you know these uh, worries about the inequalities in in rural contexts, for example, but also uh, where are we putting ourselves in these equations? You know, um, it's not enough uh, talking. You know, uh, we have to go more. Uh, we have to recognize the importance of women's contribution in the food systems. We have to recognize the relational privilege of ourselves as academics and public ent entities, for example, and understand the feminine heter heterogeneity of the rural world of, of native native Mexican populations, especially of those women who have historically lived in equality and marginality. And finally, although gender is an important category, is not separate nor unique with which to explain the complexity of the realities and intersections of the lives of Celtal women in rural Mexico and Chiapas. It, it also explains the invisible, subordinate, and often violent position of rural and native women. So I want to share with you is no hay una sola voz, ni un único cuerpo, ni un único cuidado, no hay una sola ruralidad, no hay una sola intersección. There's not only one voice, there is not only one body, there is not only one care or caregivers, there is not only rurality, there is no one there is not only one intersection. There is a lot of diversity and we have to take a into account these kind of uh, facts to make sure that we are doing the interventions right. So, Colagual, which is, thank you very much in Celtal. Muchas gracias and thank you. Now I will open the floor for, me, for Maria Gracia for the comments she can give us regarding the two topics presented. Maria Gracia, please. Thank you to Efrine. And um, um, uh, sorry, Diana. <laughs> and sorry, Diana, uh, for for these wonderful um, talks that we have heard uh, today. We have heard um, about uh, the nexus number one, the food systems of uh, the SDG Nexus uh, Network Research Area. Um, and these presentations are not only tackled tackling uh, food security and the inequalities, uh, but they are also tackling gender equalities, land tenure, and so much more from the SDGs um, um, uh, that, uh, that we know of. Um, in Diana's presentation, uh, we heard about um, the women in the Chiapas region, the Tetzal women, uh, native women, um, that have been historically marginalized by a patriarchal structure, uh, resulting in invisibility, oppression, and even structure violence. Uh, just to mention a couple of of the ones that she that she discussed, um, and it's I find very interesting that uh, this research. Uh, it focuses on the women's own narrations and on their own intersections. So it gives uh, a voice to the specific group of uh, native Tetzal women, um, Tetzal women, sorry. And um, we saw uh, that women see themselves not only as uh, not only of, as women or uh, part of a collective, uh, but um, they are artisans who are responsible for one of uh, of the highest economic subsistence, uh, um, even maybe between their families, and a huge part uh, play a a huge part in the agri agricultural system. And of course, they are the main caregivers, <laughs> which not only, um, uh, as Diana says, relates to caring, but uh, to caring, to providing, uh, to being the 
the um, creators of, of life, not only from the beginning, but throughout. And um, she also remarked that it's important to recognize the native women, not as a collective, and um, that it's very important to understand the heterogeneity um, by highlighting that there's no only one intersection. Um, Frine gave us also a clear scope of how the food value change works in another area of uh, of Mexico, which is San Luis uh, de Potosí. And here we also we also get to know the role of women from her presentation, but within the food system. We learned that uh, women in San Luis de Potosí are responsible for also food provision and they play a major role as a harvesters or marketers. Um, we know uh, now, or maybe you knew before, but <laughs> we know now how the ejidos work and how the land tenure um, works in Mexico and why this remains to be a huge challenge make it almost impossible for women to be better providers for their family, although they play the main role in their family structure because uh, they don't have access to many of the programs they could benefit just because uh, historically the society has decided how they should, that sh they should access to land. Um, she also gave a very nice overview on how Reducing these inequalities tackles not only one, but many of the SDGs at the same time, but just tackling one. Uh, and it's very, very interesting to see um, how it is important that regardless which kind of goal we are pursuing, reducing inequalities is one that we should really focus on. Both presentations, and uh, maybe here I will apologize to uh, Diana <laughs> for trying to find out similarities, but um, I think it's also, uh, I find it important <laughs> to, to, to try to find a little bit of similarities, um, respecting the two collective that has been uh, investigated from the both of you, but both presentations emphasize that female agricultures or female artisans do not only have many roles and uh, multiple burdens. They are not only providers, they are not only caregivers, and um, they play a huge, a huge part in the food system, but they are still suffering from these huge inequalities. They are marginalized they are discriminated and sometimes forgotten to the point where in some societies they even become invisible. And that is a word that really struck me. Invisibility in everything that they do. Despite doing so much and despite being in 2022. We know and we are reminded here again that... Um, something that is unrefutable, that is not refutable. Women are the backbone of the rural communities. This is, this is fact, and this is even so much research. on. And still at the same time, both topics remind me that with, why it is so important not only to work towards better and sustainable food systems, but to focus on the gender sensitive value change. Gender sensitive value change. Taking into account um, that many challenges um, that women face, rural women, native women, and women across the value chain, uh, because women prefer unrecognized work in all the categories, not only if they are caregivers, if they stay home, if they are agricultures, if they are artisans, in all the categories, they provide unrecognized work, um, making them to having less access to land, for example, as Frine reported, um, but not only land, women have less access to assets, to equipment, to networks, even agricultural training, including information and technologies that could make the whole thing a little bit better. 
and um then i think of of a word and i i'm reminded of power <laughs> it all comes back to power and who according to the society is the one to make decision and what is acceptable and what is still not acceptable we hear that they are providers. We hear that they are in, in charge of sales. We hear that they generate high income for their families. But who manage these incomes? Who decides where this income is spent? And who decides where they to invest? Although women have a lot of power, and I was reminded of this because I saw a video yesterday or the day before of um, the conflict that is happening now in Peru where agriculture, native and rural people are going to the streets and, uh, and making noise about the huge raise in, in prices. And uh, women agriculture was screaming, we are now on strike, now the city should hunger. So they have the power, but <laughs> do the society accept that they have? That, that, that is my question. And, um, yeah, I don't want to make my comment too long because I really want, uh, there's so much to discuss. So, uh, yeah, I give the floor to you, uh, Alicia, to start uh, the discussion, which I also have a couple of questions, <laughs> by the way, if I may. But let's start with, with someone else. Great, Gracia. Many thanks. You really make a, like a yeah. nice round and complete comment uh, regarding the few presentations. Uh, I will then... Uh, open the floor for questions, so I assume there will be maybe many uh, coming to, to, to our speakers and commentators. Nadia, please. Thank you. Uh, well, first, I want to thank you for all these uh, really good explanation of how the energy systems are more or less working in, in Latin American context. Uh, from the presentation, I, I really like will keep in mind the importance of like bringing the scholarship of intersectionalities to the SDG nexus and all the yeah work and research we do around this. And then I also want to ask about what are your experiences or what do you think about the approach we should have in public policies. Because as we saw, for instance, in Frenet's presentation, uh, policies for the energy systems are based on land ownership, which is one of, of the, yeah, something that women for sure not have the easiest access to. And yeah, the same question goes for Diana, for other, other normal public policies we have been like uh, normally on how the gender issues are putting quotas or, or things like that. But since it is not only the fact of being a woman, but as you mentioned before, if you are a woman, you are a woman with that ethnicity. If you are a woman who was born in a rural area and in Chiapas or in San Luis Potosí and the specific municipalities is way different than being a woman as we are researchers also. And so, yeah, my questions regarding public policies, what would you think is your recommendation on how those should be related to energy systems in order to reach the sustainable development goals or at least have more sustainable futures if you think there should be other ways of, of sustainability difference to ones. So yeah, <laughs> thank you. And that's my question. Many thanks, Nadia. Uh, maybe we can start with Frine and after that, Diana, to go in the same order. Uh, okay, thank you for the question. I think um, the recent government in Mexico is um, includes more of the, the gender discourse in their uh, politic. But um, I I see that is uh, mainly words, you know, is, is like uh, to talk about women and men in, in, in all the speeches, in all the discourses, but uh, really they are not integrated in how the women and men contributes to society. And 
I think it's not only put the word women in the in the table. It's um, include all that women means in the politic. You know, for example, I, I saw the, the, the um, rules of operation of the most recent program about land tenure, but about um, uh, agricultural uh, um, development, and still saying the, the things about uh, the ownership of the, the, the paper that proves their, own, their ownership of land. And it's the most recent, not includes these cases which women can be access to these papers. And, and it's only the word that women or men then can prove their ownership, can uh, participate or can be included in the program. But there are not a real inclusion of what to be women means. And I, I, I think um, it's necessary that gender, a gender perspective for real, not only with including the word, <laughs> uh, 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 including uh, the the all the intersectionalities that being a woman means. I think this could be a, a really good step. Understand what means uh, other things happening around a woman. And and I I, I uh, opened the, the space for Diana. Thank you, Fine, and thank you, Nadia, for this question. In Colombia, we say that when it's a very good question, and then uh, we say that because it's an impossible question to answer. <laughs> so yes, that was a question. But what can I say about that? I mean, with all the respect for you and for the, those who are watching me, I'm very, very, very uh, critical. Um, I have a very cri critical position about this CHD nexus and public policies because it's very hard to attack something that is both structure and historical you know how you how do you change um history or structures so i think this is the challenge for academia for chd nexus um to work with and for public policies uh second uh, i think uh, i totally agree with uh, Frine. Gender and intersection has become a very uh, political lobby, which has a very empty discourse. So uh, for me, for example, gender is not only men and women. Gender is a very, very uh, diverse uh, concept. So why won't we start there, you know? Uh, because by defining gender, we define a lot of identities who are not defined by that. So I think that is uh, another challenge already there. Uh, and also with inter intersectionality, uh, especially in the CHD uh, and public policy um, spaces, I think there are uh, it's becoming more and more attractive, so it's becoming more and more and more an, uh, po a political lobby. So uh, it is used as, I don't know, like a, an, a discourse, but it's not used correctly. So it can be a tool, it can be a methodolo methodological tool, and it can be like a very eye opening and very well fundamented. A tool for public policies, for example, but uh, it it ends up uh, being a political lobby with a very empty discourse. So, what can we do? Uh, I ask you. <laughs> I I I can <laughs> I uh, answer with a question: What can we do from our context, from our places of work? Um, what can we do to make this? Um, these courses not empty, rather uh, useful. Uh, 
uh, for those that we are working with in field. Thank you. Many thanks, Rene and Diana. Any other question coming from the audience? If not, I have one, just to complement what Diana was saying in the last part. So going back again to this SDGs, no? global goals, uh, leave no one behind and so on. Uh, as you say, the diversity is not included at all. It's more standardizing, not let no one behind, but not really including any uh, important role, of, especially from women in, in this uh, food that is also related with, with many other entities, but also the diversity is not included. So uh, from your experience uh, working in field, uh, do you have any recommendation Maybe, of course, not for the SDGs globally, but for working locally with SDGs. So how can it be through the whole diversity of the importance of the role of women can be included in certain projects uh, working with SDGs? Again, a very good question. <laughs> um, oh, I think... It, it... <laughs> Um, and I, I, I talk from my privilege, so it's kind of hard to answer that question because I think for fairness, first of all, that question will be, uh, it will be better answered uh, from one of the women that I've been working with, you know, they are the ones that they are living their lives and they are the ones that are facing violence, structured violence. And oppressions and inequalities. Uh, the, the one of my greater greatest learnings in this process of field with um, native populations, especially women, it's first of all learning the language. So um, I am not a good Celta speaker, but at least I understand. You know, so that we can have a, a same language. That, you know that that it's um, one of the main um, learning experience that I had. Uh, second, um, recognize your position in it as a foreign. You know, even if you're Mexican, um, I think it has a lot of uh, shades in it. Uh, uh, third. Mm, try to make uh, to provide an open space so these uh, mm, well in my case women can can talk about the, their needs can talk about their uh, their problems and third I I I recommend very highly that these women start to having the um, the I forgot the word in 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 English. Sorry. So if you can help me, uh, Spanish speakers, protagonismo. The leading leading role. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> the leading role. You know. Because if they own their own process, they can uh, make it to the finish line, you know? So yeah, make them the leading role of their own process. It's also, I think, one of the main learn uh, learnings that I have. Thank you, Diana. We have Vladimir. Question? Uh, uh, thank you for these presentations. Uh, yeah, so I don't know. Maybe I will talk as the, from the male perspective and uh, regarding these issues because gender role, gender issue is a quite important issue and it's not only related to specifically Latin America. For instance, uh, 
a pretty way and we do we did research in Central Asia because it's also important there as well. Uh, so uh, yeah, from my perspective, yeah, I would like to help to for for this uh, gender issue direction, but perhaps for the for you it will be important to identify the way how we can help what kind of role we can play with this and uh, here is a quite tricky issue first gender issue is it a cultural specific issue or is there is a something common across culture and if yes then perhaps disentangling these issues uh, also kind of foster to make uh, gender equality or pros gender, female prosperity in this direction uh, faster. Why I say is saying that the culture is important. If you go to the Central Asia from historical perspective, and oh, Gulnara is here and she can confirm that. From historical perspective, uh, female play back role we're taking the care of the family and so on, while the male was working and getting the kind of behaving as a breadwinner from that perspective. And from this, the power between, uh, power sharing between genders kind of was a, the border of the power sharing was a clear. Now we did one study where we showed that in fact, uh, moving the female from traditional society where she played a secondary role from that perspective, not working, I will probably say that is the better, to employment status, giving the opportunity to work and in uh, kind of make this type of household, this family more resilient to, for instance, the climate change shocks. The mechanism behind this is quite easy the family gains more income and bo if both uh, female and male works. So giving this, uh, spreading this information, giving this education may in fact help the uh, move to gender equality direction. And this is, yeah, so as I say that we need to disentangle whether it's cultural or there is a, something outside that can be improved as well yeah thank you um i think um one word uh, vladimir uh, said was very important power and 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 i think uh, it's really um important how it's necessary make the idea possible for women that we can have power. This, I, I think this is, is the, the, the a main uh, situation because when women um, realize that can be powerful, that can own their um, future, their decision, their, 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 their role uh, all the perspectives move in in different ways and and i think this this uh, this is i i can uh, add to 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 the idea power is really really um complicated word to talk, to to say because uh, all want to have power but mainly most of people want to have power but uh, uh, not to share and and this is uh, when I think it's the the the, the main um, complication uh, talking about uh, what uh, the power works uh, specifically for women. I will I will ask would would ask uh, Vladimir then a question. How do you conceptualize gender? You know, because for me gender is cultural. Mm -hmm. It's a very mixed concept, uh, which um, adds a little bit of an answer to Alicia's question before. 
that uh, we have to read the context. You no, know, it's not the same being a man, uh, you know, a Celtal man here, uh, and uh, Asian men in in a rural community. So we have to have this territorial approach to understand how we can uh, tack tackle these um, these issues. So yeah. Um, Because it, it, again, gender it's a very diverse for me concept. So yeah, that's my my comment. Thank you. Yeah, well, gender. How do I define the gender? Uh, yeah, there is a huge debate. If you go, for instance, to the American uh, direction where they, they define the gender as a biological aspect or as the psychological aspect. Well, it's quite complicated. I will probably not mess this. I'm not expert in this. So how were they defined? My probably, my question, uh, uh, my, uh, my comments are not controversial what you say. Probably uh, I need to clarify here. I would say that, and repeat here, how we can help so if you say that, okay, doing, doing this lead to this and improves the fe female being uh, or female position. So I'm definitely in favor of helping this. So why not? But you need to say to society and people like me, how? By identifying this simplifies and foster all these ideas and uh, we find a probably i hope we find a solution to this yeah thank you thank you vladimir again the time is getting a bit short for what it was planned um regarding with uh, your last comment vladimir there's like big debate as well about how to support so as diana say what will you willing to do uh, in this position as academics, for example, one thing we say, not giving up a position of leadership, but sharing these positions, especially going high in academia is where we visit the amount of female professors, for example. And then a way we be sharing this leading position, opening possibilities, and so on, just something that came to my mind uh, right now. Uh, if not more questions, more comments, I would like to once again thank you very much, especially to our two brilliant presenters, uh, Maria Gracia, for your comments. So three early career scientists that really inspired us uh, this morning, afternoon, and evening, depending where you are, uh, regarding the, the role of women, the diversity, and uh, all the importance that should take, uh, take it into account in the, in the context of food systems. Many thanks to you and many thanks, many thanks to all people that joined us here as, as participants. And it has, it has been a, a great time sharing ideas, sharing knowledge, and hope to see you again in next month in the next uh, SDG uh, seminar series that will be 16th of May. And with this, I would like to, to close the, the session and thanks again. <laughs>